welcome everybody to the very first Sunday of Thrive in 2022. We are so glad that you have joined us today to jumpstart your year, to begin it on the right place that God loves to and wants to be in your life a great high priority, the highest priority this year. So thank you for being a part of us. When we get kicked off today, I just want to tell you a couple of things that are happening before we jump into a time of worship and then we get to the message a little bit later. First and foremost, if you're here today, would you fill out our online connect card? Our hosts are going to post a link uh, right now that you can click on. We want everybody that comes online to fill it out. Now I know, I know, I know. Sometimes you're like, oh, I don't want to click on the link. I don't want to fill out the information. It's actually not that much, but it helps us, one, know that you were here. Two, if you're new, just check that little box. We can reach out to you and just say, thank you for being here. We do it tastefully. We just want to help make sure that you get access to everything you can to make the most of your experience as a part of Thrive. So if you're a first timer or you've been watching for a long time, maybe you've never filled it out, or maybe you're you're watching because you're still traveling a little bit, would you take a moment right now, actually right now, click the link, just put the information in, put a prayer request down so that we can be praying for you. We'd love for you to fill that out. A couple of quick things that are happening that are coming up to be excited about. Uh, we kick off a brand new series you're gonna hear about in just a few moments called Like a Boss. Uh, but this Wednesday is actually the first Wednesday of January. And we, on January 5th, every month, we have this thing called First Wednesday, a time of prayer, a time of worship, a time of taking communion together. We do it in person, we do it online, and we just wanna say it's the perfect way to start the year, to just make sure that you're going to say, God, I wanna pray and I wanna invite you to do some things in my life. I want to pray and see what you want to do in this broader community that I'm a part of called Thrive. Taking communion is always just a holy moment together. And so it's one of those things that I look forward to and I wanna encourage you to be a part. It's a new year, we've got a new direction that we're kind of following and to kind of jumpstart some things. So would you join us at 6.30 on Wednesday and be a part of this first Wednesday in January. So that's going on. Uh, we've got the Connect card, and we wanted to just talk about our offering. We have so many people that support what Thrive is doing in its mission to make it easy for people to find and follow Jesus. There are so many incredible things that God did last year, and we want to begin this year strong and ready to be in a position to move when God calls us to, to support the ministries around Thrive, the impact that we do of our do good projects in the community. So would you consider being a part of that. Maybe giving a percentage of your giving as God calls us to. Uh, maybe that's a new thing God wants you to start this year. Uh, so you can give online by clicking on the link. You can text into 84321 and kind of follow through the steps of the process. And you can set up giving and be ready to see God move through you all together as a part of Thrive Church. Because honestly, giving is really an act of worship. It's saying, God, I thank you for all you've done in me, and I want to make sure that I respond and give you all the value and worth that you are due. And I want to honor you with the very first off of what you've blessed me with. And so that sense of worship is powerful when we give. That also sets us up for what we're about to do right now. So I want you to stand up. I want you to turn up uh, the sound, and I want you to get ready to lift up the name of God wherever you're at today so that we can give honor and glory to his name. So thrive. Let's sing loud. Let's get ready. Let's worship big as we start this year. Let's worship together. Good morning, Thrive, wherever you are at out there. We just encourage you to grab your coffee, grab your family. Come to the TV screen. Let's worship together and give God the glory. And sing about there is joy in the house of the Lord today. Come on. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who will more will be. He opened the prison door. Part in the raging sea, my God, He holds a victory. Let joy in the house of the Lord, let joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. Let joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. 
Welcome everyone to 2020, 2022. Happy New Year. Uh, we are so glad that you are with us again and we hope that you are ready to kick things off like a boss. That's actually the series that we are kicking off today and we're going to be in for the month of January. Now before you think this is some sort of resolutions type of series, series it's not. Uh, that's not where we're going with it. We actually are wanting to reshape how we look at this year as, that we are about to begin. We want to help us grow in what it means to be like a boss in some qualities that are going to matter. They're going to matter because they actually matter in a significant way to God. And because they matter to him, if we can allow them to reshape our lives, it will have a big impact on you and the people around you. Now, that phrase, like a boss, you've probably heard it somewhere. Uh, and it means that towards a situation or a circumstance that you experience, that you actually go into it and you actually handle it with some confidence. You handle it with some sort of uh, intentionality and some maturity and authority. And then you handle it well. If you do that, then you actually are handling it like a boss. And there are times in life that you have felt that way when you've walked into something. You've walked into it and said, hey, I know what this is about. Uh, I'm going to make some good godly decisions. And then you walk through it and it goes the way that you think it should go. That's handling it like a boss. But I think the other side is often sometimes where we find ourselves in the different parts of our lives. 
We go into some things and, and that we start to feel a little bit underqualified or unprepared or uncomfortable. And when we walk into those situations, we, we struggle because we're not exactly sure what to do with it. We handle it anything but like a boss. I think we've experienced a lot of that over the last couple of years where life is challenging enough on its own. And then you throw in all of the accelerated changes that we've experienced through this pandemic and it radically makes us sort of not handling things very well in our lives. The things that are unexpected are going on, things that we're not looking forward to, things that, that we didn't even see coming that we're thrust into can be a big challenge. And that's the struggle that we go through. I know, I remember when we first went through some things as a church, when the pandemic hit, I remember one of the big discussions was like, okay, you know, we got to get things online and we got to make sure we do that and and lead through it. But there was this tension of going, hey, if we go online, what does that mean to the in-person experience that we have? And so there was this tension, you know, uh, that we were trying to figure out, like, how do we do this well so that people online are getting an experience that is meaningful and enriching and really kind of conveys the heart and soul of what Thrive is all about. But then we don't kind of undermine the in-person experience, which is just truly an incredibly gift that you experience when you come here. And so you see this tension between the two. And we didn't know we were going to have to kind of make this choice. And we didn't know how to navigate through it so much at the beginning. And so there's this constant debate and dialogue that we went through as a leadership team. Uh, kind of going like, how do we handle it? And where do we put emphasis? And how do we do this? And how do we do that? And, you know, when you think about even just the size of where we're at as a church, and, and church has just radically changed kind of through this whole pandemic. They call it hybrid church now because you need to be online and in person. And, you know, what's funny is we actually used to feel pretty confident about kind of how we approach church before all of this stuff went down in 2020. We felt fairly confident. We'd been through things, Pastor Sally and I, we kind of led through a lot of experiences in our lives and in our ministry. So you kind of had a sense of, okay, we, we know how to lead. We know how to get through things. And then this happens, and all of a sudden you start to question yourself. You start to wonder, like, what are we doing? And is this even right? Does this even make sense? So we started to feel anything but like a boss for a long time through this whole experience that we went through. Imagine some of you have felt like that in some area of your life, where it was hard enough before, And then you saw these changes happen and are happening in our world right now. And you start to go, wow, I feel completely unprepared, unqualified, unready for what is taking place. And you can think about the challenges that have brought to a lot of marriages in this time. You know, you think about the the parenting dynamics that's radically changed during this season. You know, being single and, and isolated at times, you know, working from home and you're alone and you're not with people. And, and you start to think about mental health and stress and anxiety. You see all of these things that just are elevating and escalating radically in our world right now. And we feel less ready for what may come next. We feel less prepared for what is coming down the road. And with a brand new year, what used to be sort of like, okay, turn the page, fresh start, new beginnings, all of a sudden we start to feel a little bit more apprehensive. And we walk into it maybe feeling a little bit more fearful. And I know that's probably where some of you are at right now today. And it's why, as we kick off this year, Pastor Sal and I felt like, you know, we really want to focus in on and get our attention around, like, how can we grow our faith and build the foundation upon what God and how he wants us to live in our lives? See, if we can approach life uh, with a stronger faith, if we can approach the situations that we go through with with a more bold, courageous faith because it's built up and it's more kind of, anchored to who God is in our lives, more like a boss, no matter what 2022 throws at us, guess what? That stronger faith in Christ is going to allow us to kind of navigate. It's going to cause us to stay strong, and it's going to allow us to see God move in us and in our lives in greater ways than we've ever seen before. And I know that some of you need to hold on to that today. And that's why this series is kicking off for the next month. We want to discover just what we can do to actually grow who God is in our lives so that no matter what comes, we are ready to go, you know what? Because God is on my side, I can approach this like a boss. And so how are we going to get there is we're actually going to be looking at some stories of some people in the Bible that actually acted like a boss. And we're going to zero in on what was the quality or trait 
One of the things in their lives that we want to kind of pull out that really could speak to us and what we're going through at this season, at this time, and this time and place in our lives. They handled life like a boss, even though things were kind of thrown at them and the stories we're going to look at. So when life throws things at us, we can learn and reply the same. Now, you hear that and you start to go, wait a minute, stories from the Bible, you know what? You're probably going to talk about some heavyweights of the faith. You're going to talk about some people that, you know what, they're not like me. I imagine some of you are thinking about that. But here's the thing. The stories that we're going to look at actually are stories about people just like us who chose to do what we're going to do in this series. They actually were people who just said, you know what, God, I'm going to trust you. God, I'm going to grow in my faith in you. God, I'm going to grow in my belief in who you are and what you promised. And I actually want to live that out and see it proved in my life. And that's why we know their stories. And that's exactly actually the story of what God wants to do in and through you as we kick off this brand new year. See, here's the thing. Lots of people want to act like a boss, but they don't want to do what it takes to actually be like a boss. And there is the trouble that we find. This is what God wants to do in us. We need to learn what it takes from God. Not on our own, because we all want to be our own bosses, don't we? But God goes, no, I want to be like a boss like God calls me to be like a boss. And these stories are going to help us get there if we can slow down and go, you know what? I want to learn from it. I want to embrace it. And I want to see what God wants to do in me. And that's our prayer and has been as we kick off this year, that God has something for you in an area of your life and a quality your character that he wants to form something deep inside of you so that you can walk into maybe some situations in your life that are you're struggling, you feel unprepared, unready, you feel unqualified to walk in and handle, but maybe because you trust God and let him grow something in you, something could change in terms of how you approach it this year. It happened just like this for a man by the name of Nehemiah. Now, I want to give you a little bit of Nehemiah's story, and then we're going to jump into Scripture in just a moment. The story of Nehemiah is this. Uh, It's an Old Testament story where the people of Israel had had fallen into a season of their story, of their history, where they had not followed God for a long time. And so God goes, you know what? You don't want to follow me. You don't want to honor me. You don't want to worship and trust me. Then I'm going to let kind of rival empires come in and conquer you. And so they're in this season of being exiled and taken away from their homeland in Israel and taken off to other lands. And it's here uh, that we meet Nehemiah. He is part of a season when the Persians had kind of ruled uh, that season and that empire. And so we get introduced to Nehemiah as he's under the reign of Artaxerxes. Uh, And what's interesting is that oftentimes when a Empire would come in and conquer another nation. They would take some of the best of the best, take them back to their land and go, hey, we want to just create a kind of an all-star team of people, of thinkers and creators. And so they take the best of the best back. They kind of indoctrinate them and train them and then put them into service. And so Nehemiah was actually one of these people. He's a Jew that was in this other country, kind of went up through sort of the diplomatic kind of government training program there. And he had worked his way up to becoming a cupbearer to the king. And not only would that mean that he would actually taste the king's food first to see if there was poison, but he was also in charge of making sure that he was a defender, kind of a last line of defense for the king And so it was a very important and influential role that we see Nehemiah had worked himself into. And and it's here uh, that that's the setting that kind of kicks things off. And Nehemiah still is very kind of connected to his Jewish roots. And so he hears about that there are some Jews who had been allowed to go back to Israel to kind of be a part of rebuilding the temple. Uh, It's one thing that one of the previous kings had allowed to do. They came back, and Nehemiah was urgent to hear what was the latest about what the conditions were in Jerusalem, the capital. And he goes, and he gets the story, and they tell him that the place is in utter ruins. The walls are broken down. There's no gates. They've been burned. It is just in shambles. And Nehemiah hears this, and something inside of him breaks, and he begins to weep over his God over his country, uh, over the people of Israel. And he starts to get to this place where he's like, you know what, something inside of him couldn't get rid of that. And so he began to pray and he began to fast. Uh, And then he began to plan and he went and he approaches the king to see if there's something he could do about it. 
just to get some favor in the king's eyes. And sure enough, the king has favor on him. He allows Nehemiah's plans to move forward. Those plans are that he gets to go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And we see in the story that he actually has great success because of it. Now, you hear that story and it seems amazing, right? He's in exile. He's a foreigner. Uh, he has no real right to any kind of position, but he rises up to some sort of leadership. God gives him favor in the king's eyes and he's able to go back and to do an incredible act and feat and he's able to see it through. It's one of those kind of feel-good stories along the way, right? But the truth is, when you look at what happened, there is a God-driven purpose and calling behind the whole thing. No, mostly he's like taking Nehemiah and who he had become, and he's actually guiding and directing Nehemiah to accomplish a purpose and task that's all for God's glory and God's honor. Now, there's, there's a quality that emerges that, that we really see in Nehemiah, and it's something that I think we need to exhibit in our lives, and it's really kind of the one behind the whole impetus to kind of rebuild this wall around Jerusalem. And it's actually something inside of us that each of us can sometimes fail to leverage for God's good in our lives and the people around us. See, me and Maya, he was like a boss without a doubt. You read this book and it is absolutely incredible, page after page about what God does through him. But he demonstrated something that we need. And we need to kick off this year thinking about and approaching things with to explore in our own lives. But I actually want to read the story as it comes from Scripture so that we can start to get the sense of just what God was doing. So Thrive, first time of the year. I know we're online. It doesn't matter, but I hope you're ready. Let's do this. Thrive, let's open our Bibles. Yeah, let's do it. We're going to be in the book of what? Nehemiah, yeah, no surprise. Book of Nehemiah, we're going to start in chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to get into it. If you want to follow along with us, you can actually jump into the YouVersion Bible app. Uh, click on the menu, go to live events, Thrive Church CA, Thrive Church California. You can follow along with us with all the scriptures if you'd like to. This is what it says. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Hen and I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. They were in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. I want you to jump down to chapter 2, verse 4 now with me. And then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. I'm pivoting here because I want to just kind of get a little bit at the beginning of the story. So he prays, he fasts, he goes to God for a season. He feels like he needs to go before the king, and that's where we pick it up in verse 4. He said, I prayed to the God of heaven and answered the king. The king asked him, hey, what's going on? You seem a little down. And this is what Nehemiah says. He goes, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so I can rebuild it. I want you to jump down again and go to verse 17 just to get a little bit more of the arc of the story. He says, Then I said to them, See the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. You see what happens in the story. God gives him this kind of feeling inside about what he needs to do. He goes before the king. The king says, yes. He goes back. Now he's got to tell the people about this. He's like, hey, I, let's rebuild the wall. We will no longer be disgraced. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. You see the different parts of the story of what God had done. It's pretty incredible, this arc of what happened. The background, you kind of know of what led them there. He's in exile. Nehemiah's in Persia. These Jews returned from Judah, from the area right there in Jerusalem. And the very thing he wants to know is what's going on back home. Give me the news. You know what? 
hit me up so I can get a sense of what is going on in our homeland because his heart, even though he had grown up and he'd lived in this other place, was to be back in the place where God had called his people to be. So he asks, he finds out they're in disgrace. That burden just kind of compels him to kind of go, what can I do? And God's like, hey, I want you to rebuild the wall. So he has the courage to go before the king and speak out and ask him, give me favor, can I go back? And then we see something incredible. The king says, yes, he goes back. The people rally and they begin to build a wall. See, Nehemiah walks into this situation and he actually does something that's required in a moment like this when there's a problem that's going on. Like he doesn't know exactly how to approach this other than he knows he's got to kind of get a, a, be given some vacation time from the king. He needs to have some resources to be helped, to be able to kind of go do the thing that he feels like he should go do. And then he, he needs to get some people to rally behind him in a place that he doesn't know anybody and isn't from to be able to do a task. It really comes down to this. He leads. He leads. I mean, that's what this whole endeavor required. From the moment that Nehemiah hears about this problem, about what was going on in Jerusalem, he chooses to actually lead. Anytime in moments of crisis and moments of trouble and moments where problems are going on and where change is required, right, you know what? It's in those times that leadership is actually a crucial part for helping things become the way God intended them to be. For Nehemiah, that meant rebuilding a wall. It was Nehemiah's way to actually restore the honor of his God, which would then restore the honor of his people. See, godly leadership looks, and when they see something maybe broken down, or they see something that's not as it should be, or it's kind of moving beyond what God would have it to become, or it's off track from the path that God longs for it to be on, aimless, uh, not moving forward, maybe going backwards. It's in those moments where God wants leaders to step in and actually chart a course to move it to where God longs for it to be. That's what leadership is all about. Now, Nehemiah acted in ways that leaders do. And it's this. See, godly leaders always have a burden to build. Godly leaders always have a burden to build. Now, I know that minute that word leader came out of my mouth, that most people kind of had a reaction to it. I would say everybody has a reaction to it. There's a very small percentage of people who kind of sit up and are like, you know what? Yeah, it's time to lead. And they feel that there's something in them that's maybe called to do that. But I think overwhelmingly, there's a larger group of people that sit back and says, I'm not a leader. I'm not wired that way. You know what? I don't know what that is. I mean, if I ask people to kind of raise your hand and like, be like, hey, where am I at? They'd be like, you know what? I'm not a leader. And that's the reaction I think most people would kind of respond to because they think a leader is someone who's in charge of people and they're CEOs and they're, they're kind of executives or they're like people who are kind of up the chain somewhere. Like those are leaders in there. But I got to tell each of you something today. Everyone is a leader somewhere in their life. Everyone, and that includes you. It's because leadership is simply influence to move people in a positive direction. That's what leadership is. It's influencing the people around us. It's influencing even leading yourself. It's influencing yourself to go, I need to move in a direction. And you think godly leadership is going, you know what? I want to move the people around me. I want to move myself to go in the direction that God has called me and to live through his word and the things that he has placed before me in my life. Here's the thing. If everyone's a leader, you're a leader somewhere in your life. If you're a mom or a dad, you're a leader. If you're married, you're a leader. If you're dating, you're a leader. You're probably a leader in some role or capacity at work, even if you don't have the title and people work for you. If you have the ability to influence the person who sits next to you or the the person on the crew that you work on, like there's the ability for you to have influence, you're a leader. See, if people listen to you or people care uh, about maybe what you think or, or your ideas, you're a leader. Now, you're a leader if you're a parent, if you're a teacher, a spouse, a friend, a family member, a staff member, a project manager, whatever. Every one of us is a leader somewhere in their life. This matters. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. 
He didn't have probably a ton of people working for him. He literally tasted food. That was his job. And sometimes we can be in roles that we just kind of go, I don't know if I'm qualified. I don't know if I'm supposed to be there. But if we don't think we're a leader, we can miss out on the calling that God has for us. One of the people as a part of our executive leadership team for a long time felt this way. Uh, many of you, if you've been around Thrive at all, you'll have met Paula Evans. Paula Evans uh, and her husband Vic have been a part of our church since the very inception of Thrive. They were part of our launch team. She's on our executive leadership team. Uh, Paula is just one of those people that Sally and I just recognized early on as someone that just caught the vision of what we wanted to our church to be about. Um, but intrinsically, Paula looks at herself and is like, yeah, I'm not a leader. And, and she would reiterate this and kind of say these things, especially when we'd have leadership team meetings. And she's like, I'm not a leader. I'm not even sure why I'm here. Sometimes she would get into this thought and we would just look at her and go, Paula, because you, you care about people and, and you speak and there's some really wise things that you offer to us. And, and you have the ability to kind of rally people and your guys' leadership in the area of marriage at our church and wanting marriages to get better. And, and, and financially, she's a part of our finance team here at Thrive and just making sure that we just do things with accountability and, and strength and character. There's so many different places she has her hand and she's clearly a leader, but she didn't see it for the longest time in herself. And that was undermining the potential of what God wanted to do in and through her. And so all of a sudden, the wheels began to change, and things began to move in her, and she started to recognize, because she said, look, you're a leader, you're here for a reason, and God has just strategically and purposely used her to have a huge impact on people who walk through these doors at our church. She had to have a mind shift, and I'm guessing some of you do as well. See, Nehemiah could have chalked up what he heard from those guys to going, oh man, gosh, I wish somebody would have done something. You know, I wish somebody would go back. I wish somebody would step up that's in Jerusalem and, and, and think about rebuilding the walls and I'm not in the position to do anything about this. That's the response he could have given, but he didn't. And he experienced something inside of him that Paula kind of figured out and Nehemiah figured out and it was this, godly leaders, you need to let God lead you first. See, that's what Nehemiah did. He understood that, wait a minute, God was doing something in me, and if he might be calling me to step out, and he might be calling me to step up in terms of helping influence others in a place or a part of our lives, and that is the most powerful thing. So Nehemiah is deeply moved, which called him into action. It called him to take steps forward to see something that was a huge problem that reflected on his God and on his people. And so God might be calling you to actually do the same in some part of your life, maybe in a way or in an area that you didn't expect. See, but if you let God lead you, if you let God lead you to take some steps to go, maybe you are in a position of influence, watch out because God wants to do something big through you. And he wants to do something to use you to impact some of the people in your life. I want you to get this, and this is so important as we kind of start this year. Say this after me. I am a leader. Say it with me. I am a leader. See, that's what we experienced then from Nehemiah. He walks into this new role because he said, you know what, God, I'm going to let you lead me before I let anything else happen. And then we start to see what comes next. He's recognizing he's a leader. So he goes, God, I want to be a godly leader that follows you. And all of a sudden, we see some things begin to emerge. There's this burden that hits his heart, and the burden leads him to want to rebuild this wall. See, godly leadership always moves you deeply inside for something. That's the burden that's there. And we need to learn what exactly is that in our lives, because that's going to direct you in the place that God wants you to lead. See, godly leaders are moved by a burden for what's broken. Godly leaders are moved by a burden for what's broken. Remember, go back to verses three and four of Nehemiah one. It says, then he said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down. The gates have been destroyed by fire. So here's this problem. But the problem could have been just like, oh, that's too bad, which is what a lot of people who are choosing not to lead would do, but Nehemiah responds like a godly leader. Verse four, when I heard this, I sat down and wept. Something in him completely broke because of the status of what he experienced. 
He's like, from days I mourned, I fasted, and I prayed to the God in heaven. This tells you about how Nehemiah deeply cared for his people and for his city. And when he finds out the walls are in ruin, he's like, you know what? This isn't okay. Something's not right about this. Something needs to change about this. See, in the Old Testament times, for a city's walls and its gate to be completely decimated just brought incredible disgrace on people because that wall represented strength and it actually was a reflection on the God that you believed in. That wall and that gate represented the strength of who your God was. And so to have tall, strong, fortified walls and, and reinforced gates just made sure people understood, you know what, there's a God who watches over this. And Nehemiah was broken because of what those walls talked and showed everyone else about who his God was. So from this condition, he's like, you know what, God, something needs to change. Something needs to be different in this moment. <laughs> the God of all of the other nations looking in at Jerusalem, like their God is powerless, their God is weak, their God isn't doing anything. That's what people would have seen when they looked at Jerusalem. And Nehemiah knew differently. He was like, God, we need to do something about this. And we need to change this. He cares so deeply about this situation back in his homeland. That's the key here. The deep caring that you have for something that's broken. That's something that's not right. Something that you want to go, you know what? There's some change that needs to happen in this situation. That was the burden that grew inside of Nehemiah for the thing that was actually broken. And it's from that burden in the depths of our souls that God can begin to go, you know what, there's a solution that may come from that. I'll never forget when I was back in seminary, I was in graduate school, and uh, I was in the Bay Area going to school and a number of years ago, and I met some friends that were part of the program that I was in, and uh, a couple of them were from Hawaii. And I remember talking to one of them, his name, name was Shane. And we start chatting and you start talking and, you, you know, you get to know the basics about their family and what they're about. But eventually all the conversation was turned to like, hey, like, what are you here for? Like, why did you feel like God was bringing you to this place to go and, you know, extend your education and, you know, get a master's degree in, in some area? And Shane began to talk about where he was going. And people were like, oh, I'm going to go to some city in the States and I'm going to plant a church or this and that. But Shane was like, no, I'm going to go back to my home. I want to go back to the island where I'm from. He's like, there's a lot of lost people. There's a lot of people that think they know about who God is. They kind of grew up with something, but they're not following him. And he began to just pour his heart out about how he cared so much for his people back on the island upon which he came from. He's like, I want to go back and I want to start churches. I want to have impact. I want to start programs and ministries and I want to reach kids. And he just had this incredible picture of what he wanted to do. You could hear the burden in his voice and you could see just the passion in his eyes for what he was called to do. And you know what? You were like, man, that is incredible. I love what was going on. That burden was there because he recognized something that was broken from where he was from. And that burden is something that comes from God. His burden was so deep that he's like, God, you know what? I, I want you to be honored in this place. God, I want people to know you in this place. God, I want people to see you. So I want to go back and I want to make sure that people can experience that firsthand of what he's done in me. I want them to experience it as well. And so we see this in the story of Nehemiah. His heart hurt for God to be honored. See, that's the place where God wants us to kind of look. Because I think that's where this whole thing comes with like leadership. There's some areas in our lives where God goes, you know, I want to use you to do something, to change something in you or in your world or in your family, in your relationship. See, when our hearts hurt for an area, that's kind of a clue for maybe the burden that we have for something. And sometimes your burden might be for a group or a group of people somewhere, but I think ultimately sometimes it just starts for, what does your heart hurt for? What's your heart burdened for? You might look in your life, in your situation where you're at right now and go, you know what, I, my, my heart's kind of burdened for my marriage right now. My heart's kind of burdened for, for my family right now. My, my heart's burdened for some people, you know, that I'm connected with that are hurting in my, my extended family or some people in my neighborhood or some situation that I discovered that's going on. If your heart just kind of comes back to it and it hurts and it's burdened and you're going, you know what, God, you know what, something needs to happen here. This is God calling you to begin to pay attention because there's some godly leadership that he might be asking you to step in and to do something about. If you're curious what that is, we see Nehemiah's response. 
Ultimately, in Nehemiah 2, he does a couple of things, or Nehemiah 1, he does a couple of things to answer that question. He prays and he fasts. He really wants to know if this kind of response that he has about the walls being burnt down, is this really something that God wants to do in him? Is it sad or is it, you know what, God, it's a burden that I cannot shake. So he begins to pray. He begins to go without food and he just says, God, I want to pray to you because I want to know exactly what you want. And it became clear. His heart hurt. And his heart hurt was so much that God was calling him to actually step in and do something in it. See, God went and spoke and gave Nehemiah direction. He gave Nehemiah wisdom. He gave Nehemiah some favor about what were the next steps that he needed to take. See, we got to go to God when you feel like there's this burden inside you of going like, I need to do something. God, I need you to move. we got to reach out to him. Just make sure that it is from him. Because remember, this is all about godly leadership there's a lot of areas of our lives that are pretty close to home that honestly could probably use some godly leadership. But we've got to be able to have a burden for it. Because if we have a burden and we're broken down and we go to God, he will point out exactly what it is he wants to do in you. See, God tells our hurt, hearts, honestly, that they should hurt for people who don't know Jesus. Maybe the lost and the broken that are in your family or in your severe uh, uh, of influence, right? God tells us our family should be a place that our hearts should instantly go and we should look and kind of go, where are things at with that? Is it okay? Is it not? Because there might be some leadership very, very close to home that he's wanting you to take the first steps to influence things in a great godly direction for him. So I think that's the call of where things begin. You got to have this burden for the broken, for something that's broken. You recognize what it is, and you start to begin to feel it, and you go, okay, God, you might want me to exercise some leadership in this. And Where does it move from there? See, that's the thing about burdens. The burden in you needs godly leadership from you. That's the heart of what we see in Nehemiah. The burden was there. And now it's godly leadership time to actually see him move into action from Nehemiah himself. See, when you start to discover this burden, you've got to focus then your leadership. You've got to let it point you in a direction, which then requires you to go, it's not just enough to have a burden. Nehemiah actually gets a plan in place to do something about it. See, which is why godly leaders make the burden become a blueprint to build. See, this is where things begin to take shape and take action. You begin to read the story into chapter 1 and into chapter 2. There's a whole bunch of things that Nehemiah, when he prayed and he fasted, and he knew that God was calling him to lead, he starts to do some extraordinary things. One, he had to get permission from the king. Two, he needed to make sure that he actually asked the king for, for favor in terms of getting him ability to travel safely. He needed resources from the king. He needed a letter from the king, like making him a leader in Judah so he could become the governor and have influence there. He needed to have the ability to, to be able to marshal the people. He, he needed, there were so many elements that had to go into this. But because Nehemiah had this burden, he started to go, you know what, what's it going to take to actually see this burden become something that's built, something that's changed. That burden was for a wall. That wall needed to be rebuilt. And he began to think through the different things that need to go on. Imagine at this point you're starting to think about maybe a burden that you've got. Maybe it's for your marriage. Maybe it's something in your workplace. Maybe it's for some friends at your school. And you start to think about some of the things that are going on. You're going, okay, you know what? I'm not sure what I could do. This is where you got to go to God, begin to pray, and start to go, okay, where can I lay these things out? What's the plan that God wants to put in place? What's the thing that needs to happen to see some change in a godly way in this situation? See, that's the power of what takes place. Because whatever you have a burden to lead in, you need a godly plan to follow to actually see it come to fruition. That plan in your life could be, you know what, I need to get back to God's word. And like, what does he say about this situation? Maybe there's some burden you have for your financial situation. You go, okay, God, what do you want me to do? God, you know, I start, need to start giving to you and make that a priority. God, I, mean, I need to really start saving. God, I need to change my spending habits. God, I need to have some conversations at home. God, I need to put a budget in place. God, I need to all of a sudden those plans and those action steps. And I think sometimes we get to this part and we start going, you know what, it's too much. God, I have this burden that I want to change. I maybe have tried some stuff before, but I don't really know if I can do it. See, that's the thing. When God's behind it and God's calling you to it, God's gonna help motivate you and lead you that when you start taking the steps of faith to see it happen, you'll start to see God's favor accompany what's going on in you. 
When you start to see God's hand and his favor, like Nehemiah had these things and the king said, yes, you can go. Yes, you'll be governor. Let me pay for it. I'm actually gonna send troops along with you to protect you on the dangerous journey. I'm gonna give you letters of introduction to all of the regional governors so nobody gets in your way. I'm gonna make sure that, that, that you have everything at your disposal to see this thing become a success. It went beyond what he could have thought and that was all because of the favor of God on the situation. Have you given God a chance because of the burden you feel to go, you know what, God, I want you to help lead me as I lead some change. Maybe I lead some growth. Maybe I lead in a new direction. Maybe you need to step back and go, God, there's some things that need to be rebuilt in my life. In that place of where you go, you kind of kickstart this year. There's a new mentality and approach that sometimes we need to take in order to see things change in our lives. We've seen this at times, maybe in different parts. You've probably done this somewhere. Sometimes in the areas that we struggle the most, it's hardest the most. Pastor Sally actually reminded me uh, of someone in our church who's been a part of it for such a long time. Uh, Megan Morgan, one of our thrivers, uh, has experienced a pretty radical transformation over the last year. I had a conversation with her this week about it, just to kind of make sure I understood the details. In the last year, Megan has lost over 100 pounds. It's pretty remarkable. If you go back and I said, hey, take me back to where you were at before things were going on. I mean, she'd worked at health clubs and she struggled with trying to figure out what to do to get healthy for a long time. She goes, I knew a lot of the right things to do, but I just couldn't put it all together. She goes, really what happened in me is that I really felt like God was calling me to really make a change. There was something in me that just wasn't okay with where it was at. She goes, I experienced some significant loss with the death of her father and her house burned and the fires, you know, a couple years ago. And so there's all these really difficult things that went on. She goes, and for the first time, she goes, I didn't like fall under the weight of those things. They felt like my faith actually strengthened me in those seasons. And that gave me the courage to go, wait a minute, how about I apply this faith strength to lead this area of my life that really does need to see some change? And so she started to kind of go, you know what? God's moving me. I see his faith strengthening me. I'm going to start putting this plan into action. And all of a sudden, she was faithful. She started to just meticulously and strategically just start to walk through and begin to change things in her. And all of a sudden, over the course of time, radically changed her health. And now she's able to share her journey of encouragement and ups and downs and, and ways to help encourage other people. And she brings her faith into it to say, you know what? It really has started with a God thing. And she took the courage and the step to move forward in it. And I think that's the thing with leadership. We have to have the courage like Nehemiah did. In that moment when he went to the king and it could have been the end, the king could have said, get away from me and it's over with. But he had the courage to step in and go, this burden is too big. I want to move forward. And what God wants to do in this situation, Megan took that step of going, you know what, I'm going to do this all again. And I'm going to see that my faith is the foundation upon which I'm going to build this whole idea about my health. And it's impacted now her family. It's impacted other people. Nehemiah, we see he rebuilt a wall in 52 days. Because the people rallied and some incredible things happened to change the situation of Jerusalem. There's a situation in your life that God wants to change in you. But you have to ask yourself this question. Where does God want you to lead? That recognizes that, you know what? I am a leader. God's called me to lead, which means godly leadership is a part of the choice they make every single one of us. We have to go to him and say, God, what's the burden? What's the area? What's the place in my life, the relationship, the situation, God, that needs to leadership? Is it me? Is it some relationship close to me? Is it, is it making a difference of stepping in and helping in my church to, to advance it forward in some way? There's a lot of different ways you can answer the question, but where is it that God wants you to lead? Start with the burden. And once that burden is there and you pray and you fast about it, you can take that step to go, okay, God, how can I move that burden into a blueprint to actually build something to be a part of what you want to do? I hope that you're ready. Going, you know what? There are some areas of my life. There are some things in my life that really do need to change. I want you to just pray with me now. And ask God to just speak to you. So where is it that area he wants you to lead? Let that be the beginning of something incredible that God wants to do in your life.
this year. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just say thank you right now. That as we kick off this year, we're talking about godly leadership. And we see it all throughout scripture where people saw a situation that wasn't okay. And they stepped in to help influence people and lead people. And God, actually, this is the model of Jesus. Where humanity was off course and you came to this earth to die on a cross and to come back to life to cleanse the slate, God, to start us fresh because of our sin and allow us to walk in newness of life. God, that was leadership influencing us to go, we don't have to live in that old one anymore. We could walk in something new. God, that is the example of who you are. We see it in Nehemiah. We see it in your story. God, and you're calling that to be our story as we start this new year. So God, I pray for the marriages that need leadership. I pray that we wouldn't wait for the spouse to get fixed or to change, God, but we would lead and the way that you would call us to go forth. And then we would sit down and go, what are some things that I can actually do? God, with my family, with my kids, and how I parent, and how I respond, and how I talk, and how we interact. Maybe a husband and a wife need to get together and get on the same page. God, I pray that you would bring some godly leadership to finances, to workplaces. God, to, to sibling relationships, to kids with their peers at school. God, for your kids to be able to influence others to come to one youth. God, I pray that you would allow... Uh, thrive to become a place where people recognize that they are divinely called by God to lead and influence in the parts of their lives. That God, you've put a burden inside of us to go, something needs to change. That burden says it's not okay, and it's time that we build something that God is honored by. So God, where do you want us to lead? God, I pray that you would place that answer on every single person's heart, that we would look to you before anything else. And if we do, we can see God. The very beginnings of change, the very beginnings of a new way to go in our lives, the very beginning of something that could possibly be because we are turning and letting you be the one to start by leading us and letting us follow your direction to lead those around us to build something incredible that gives you honor and gives you glory. Because God, when we do that, we cannot go wrong. And God, there are families and homes and there are situations and, and, and there are trouble areas and problem stuff that people deal with in so many different spheres that need you at the very heart of it all, but it requires often a leader to direct people to that. And God, may you start with each and every one of us God, that requires that we actually make sure that we are letting you, Jesus, be the leader of our lives. And by that, I mean we accept you into our lives and say, God, you are the one that I'm going to build everything around in my life. I pray that we would start there, that if someone hasn't made that choice to follow you, that they would. That they would say, I want Jesus to come into my heart, my soul, my mind. And I want him to forgive me and let me start new. God, when we begin there, then everything in terms of where you call us changes. So God, would you help us to know where you want us to lead as we start this year? And we give you thanks, God, for it. In your name we pray. Amen. This is actually an exciting way to begin because we even think about this for us as a church and what this means. You know, for Pastor Sally and I, as we kind of lead pastors of the church and where this wants to go, we just are in a season of going, you know what, God, there are some things you want to do in our church. We've got a lot of new people come. We've seen our online community continue to change uh, and grow through this season of things and people commit to kind of introducing themselves to thrive or letting us actually introduce ourselves to them. And, and so we've got a couple things that we just want to share that are coming up that we want you to join with us in. You know what? This coming Wednesday is actually first Wednesday. And whether you're online or you're able to come in person, would you join us? Because we want to intensely start this year as a time of praying together, going, God, we want you to move in our church and in each and every one of our lives in a bold way as we start this year. Would you commit to getting on Echo daily, the prayer app, and follow along with Thrive Church's prayer feed that five days a week, Monday to Friday, we're putting out a community prayer. Sometimes we put out prayer requests uh, for things that are going on. We want to just pray. We're going to hear in a couple of weeks about how we need to fast to see some powerful things happen and to see God's favor moving us. 
So we have a season that we're walking into of that happening. And ultimately, we know there's some bigger things coming down the road for us as a church. Like two services is something we need to move to just because of what's happening in the auditorium on a regular basis. And we are feeling like God wants us to be ready to position to see God grow in our church. And we can't wait to see what God has for us. We have some other things that are coming that we are excited that's going to help focus us and make sure that we are living out the calling and the vision of creating a church where unchurched, de-churched people love to attend, where we make it easy for people to find and follow Jesus. And we can't wait for you to join us in this journey together. Some great things that are happening, and it can start in your life. Where does God want you to lead? That's the very beginning of our series, because if you can answer that question, you can start off this year like a boss, just like Nehemiah. And we want you to just let that begin, and not just let this question be a moment for now, but I want you to write that question down so that you put it in a place where you're reminded of where God wants you to lead in your life. Because you answer that question, and that'll just put you down a path of really seeking God. Maybe you want to read the book of Nehemiah and just see this incredible story unfold. But that's just this week. We're going to continue on next week as we jump into another part of just seeing where God wants us to lead. We're going to look at the story uh, of a woman in the New Testament by the name of Martha and about how she kind of gets a bad rap for something. Uh, and we're going to kind of upend that a little bit and take a look at a story that to see God do something big in your life, that's what we continue next week with another installment of Like a Boss. So we want to say thank you for being a part of Thrive. We want to say thank you for your generosity. Uh, we want to say thank you for stepping in and going, I'm going to commit to be a part of what God wants to do in my life, and I'm going to be online. I'm going to come in person and see God move. So we'll see you back next week uh, for part two of Like a Boss. We love you. We're praying for you. Can't wait to see you next time. God bless you, and thanks you for being a part of Thrive Online.